Welcome to the Immunological Reviews podcast. My name is Justina Stadamlik, and I am delighted to be here with Dr. Jeffrey Bluestone, the A.W. and Mary Margaret Clawson Distinguished Professor and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost at the University of California, San Francisco. Throughout his career, Dr. Bluestone has made enormous contributions to our understanding of the mechanisms and importance of regulating T cell responses. His work has had far-reaching implications into elucidating the basic immunological mechanisms of tolerance and the development of novel therapeutics. And he is the guest editor of Volume 241, entitled Mechanisms of Tolerance. Dr. Bluestone, during your career, how have you seen the field of immune tolerance develop? Well, um, I'm pretty old, so I have seen a lot. Uh, if you think back to when I started, uh, back in the 70s, uh, we thought of immune tolerance as an active mechanism based on early work by Sir Peter Medawar and Brunette and a number of other people really demonstrating that um, the thymus in particular uh, caused deletion of all the cells that might respond in the periphery. And so we were tolerant because of s this central mechanism in the thymus. Uh, over the last three to four decades, we've learned it's far more complicated, that the thymus isn't as complete as we would hope it to be in deleting all of the self-reactive cells, that the periphery has developed an enormous number of mechanisms that it uses to try to control unwanted immune responses. And the whole field of self-non-self -self discrimination has really brought in a wealth of different cell types from dendritic cells and macrophages, T cells, B cells, even the innate immune response, including NK cells and uh, mast cells, uh, that all participate in making these choices. So really what we've learned in the last several decades is that the immune system is a delicate balance. In order to be able to recognize every foreign virus and bacteria in the world, it's created a very robust mechanism for effective immunity. But at the same time, to try to protect against self-reactivity destroying one's pancreas and diabetes or brain and multiple sclerosis. There are just a whole series of, of interrelated regulatory loops that are combined to really shut down the immune response such that it's actually very difficult to initiate an immune response in many settings. And what was once thought to be the, um, the primary responsibility of the immune system to recognize and destroy uh, now I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that the immune system is designed to regulate and control, whether it's in pregnancy, whether it's in gut flora and the commensal bacteria that colonize each of us, or whether it's just protecting us from destruction of self tissue. The immune system is quite highly regulated. What have been the most seminal discoveries in the field? Well, I think that there are too many to even consider uh, in one short conversation. But some of the things that have been very close to me in my career that have impacted what I've done um, have, have really changed the way I think about uh, immune tolerance. I think the first is the discovery that, um, that the periphery plays a very important role in tolerance. Uh, it's funny, we, we now talk about regulatory cells, regulatory T cells and B cells. But back in the early 80s, there was the whole field of suppressor cells which really started a lot of this uh, sense that the immune system is highly controlled. And although a lot of that work was controversial and hasn't panned out, it really opened up, I think, my eyes and, and, and many in the field to the notion of this highly regulated network of cells that we have. So I'd put among the, the, the really important discoveries is the more recent work by Sakaguchi and, and Shivak and, and others uh, uh, really identifying cells that uh, really control or regulate the immune response. And when some of the European groups in England and elsewhere have really employed these concepts into transplantation and autoimmunity, it's really helped us to understand how to control an immune response. I think another seminal um, discovery really was the whole field of co-stimulation the concept that in order for a T cell to get activated, it needed more than one signal, one through the T cell receptor and then a secondary set of signals that would augment or enhance uh, uh, that activation phenotype of a, of a T cell. And uh, when Kevin Lafferty and, uh, and others really identified co-stimulation as a core process in activating the immune system, that was to me uh, a very important concept 
because it meant that when, when T cells usually interact with self antigens, they don't respond unless they have an activated dendritic cell or other cell that provides these co-stimulatory signals. Of course, among those, CD28 is the one closest to my heart. Uh, we, we have a, a volume in this, uh, in this book talking about CD28 co-stimulation and its important importance. But another volume by Chen Dong, uh, another chapter by Chen Dong, also talks about other co-stimulatory molecules like ICOS um, and, and others, uh, CD40 ligand, all of which play an important role in manifesting a fully complete T-cell response. And there are the cytokines as well, IL-2 being a critical cytokine to help promote T-cell expansion and co-stimulation in that regard. So this whole con concept about co-stimulation to me was really very important. Uh, along with that came the, the, the flip side, uh, which I think is going to turn out to be one of the most clinically um, uh, critical pathways for immune tolerance, and that is breaking it. And the importance of these what we call negative uh, co-stimulatory molecules such as CTLA-4 and PD-1 uh, which have been instrumental in, uh, in now new cancer therapies and Jim Allison talks about that and how um, by blocking these negative regulators that turn off immune responses both the, the effector T cell and function in the regulatory T cells that by controlling these negative regulators you can enhance or promote an immune response against tumors and that is already in the clinic and hopefully will we'll end up saving people's lives. So in the field of co-stimulation, both the on and the off have been really critical findings. I think another area in co-stimulation, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in uh, immune tolerance, which I think is quite seminal, is an appreciation for the role of the innate immune response. I think people thought about tolerance purely from the perspective of T cells and B cells. But now we know that inflammation can highly control whether a, a protein is immunogenic versus tolerogenic. And I, and I think that the work uh, summarized by Larry Turka in, in, in his chapter, as well as others in this volume, really highlight the critical importance of the TLR, LPS, and other pathways in which uh, maturation or alteration of dendritic cells and other populations in the immune system really do control whether an antigen is being seen as immunogenic or tolerogenic. And some of the seminal work by Ralph Steinman and Michelle Nussenzweig really helped to articulate the different subsets of cells and depending on their state of maturation, whether they lead to a productive immune response or not. And that becomes essential in viral infections and in other settings in which the, um, the inflammation and innate immune response induced by the, the, the pathogen really are what's critical to determine whether you get a productive uh, immune response, which Pam Ohashi speaks to uh, in, in, in her uh, chapter uh, in this volume. So I think that's a big area, one that's going to be an important target area for the future, namely uh, the innate system and how that integrates uh, with uh, the T cell and, and B cell uh, systems in, in an immune response. Again, there are a lot of areas. Uh, I, I think, and, and a colleague of mine, Mark Anderson, writes about this in, in the volume, um, the whole field now of, of this transcription factor, AIR, which uh, has really changed the way we think about central and peripheral tolerance. I think everybody saw those as two very separate fields up until uh, the discovery of AIR. Uh, because people thought the thymus deleted all of the cells that saw self antigens that were presented in one way or another in the thymus, and then the peripheral systems took care of things once the the, uh, the T cells escaped that would otherwise see self. But now we understand through uh, the discovery of this molecule air that it controls the expression of otherwise only peripherally expressed antigens in a small subset of thymocytes and that controls the deletion of cells that otherwise would only see those proteins in the periphery like insulin where it's in the pancreas and the beta cells but it's also in this small subset of, uh, of epithelial cells uh, in the thymus and now more recently uh, Mark's discovery that this peripheral expression of air can also cause uh, immune modulation in the periphery by air expressing cells really starts again to link up 
the central tolerance mechanisms with the peripheral tolerance mechanisms. So that to me is a, a third ab absolutely key area. And then I guess the last area um, that, that I would focus on as being seminal would be the whole concept of um, how, to, how to exploit basically this whole notion of active suppression, active regulation, and the different subsets of T regulatory and B regulatory cells and how they really can control immunity. And I mentioned early on that that was a conceptual shift from a setting in which people thought clonal deletion and clonal energy were the dominant mechanisms to tolerance, to now thinking in everything from pregnancy, which Betts talks about in his chapter, to transplantation, which Wood talks about in her chapter, how these regulatory cells can be really adapted um, to control tissue-specific responses, to control general immune homeostasis, and to control just the overall immune balance. And, and uh, the discovery of FOXP3 as the major transcription factor uh, really helped to unravel and, frankly, to validate the notion of a suppressor cell again some 30 years later. And in Rudensky's chapter, he talks about FOXP3 and how it controls the regulatory program. So I, I'd raise that as being one of the most seminal, seminal discoveries over the last 30 years as well. What do you envision as the next generation of studies? Yeah, I mean, what's great about immunology is, and, and all of science, is you never know where the next great breakthrough was. It's now only, only 20 years ago or less that we really could start studying T cell receptors that were cloned. Only 10 years ago that we understood the whole field of, of TLRs and PAMPs and DAMPs and, 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 the, and the role of innate immune response. So it's hard to predict where the future will go. But I'd highlight a couple of things, I think. Number one, I think the future is in human immunology to a large extent. I think we've learned a lot from our animal models and animal studies, those are key. But we know the immune system is going to be more complex in humans. We know that uh, epigenetic uh, changes are going to be key and that really is driving the human genome to express differentially its genes that it has. We know that um, the biomarkers that we're going to need to be able to identify pa people who are tolerant versus non-tolerant are going to be dependent on looking in humans who have a mature immune system that have immune system that's been impacted by viruses and bacteria their whole lives. So we, we really need to do first-rate human immunology and, and I see that a big area in the future. Therapy. I think we are on the verge of having some real tolerogenic therapies that will be applied to, to humans. Uh, in, the, um, in the volume, um, Jerry Nepom and, and others talk about there the work of the Immune Tolerance Network in trying to deliver uh, tolerogenic immunotherapies to patients in allergy, asthma, transplantation, autoimmunity. And there I think we're going to make great strides because we'll be able to use those clinical trials to help us understand the biomarkers, to help us understand what is a tolerant or non-tolerant state in humans so frankly we can start withdrawing drugs because who would put their kidney or liver at risk right now of rejection if we don't have a good marker to know that when we withdraw the drugs that they won't uh, be targeted um, by the immune system. So I think we're going to see a lot more clinical trials. I think in those clinical trials we're going to see cell therapy trials where people start putting back in intradic cells that are tolerogenic, start putting back in regulatory cells that see alloantigens or see self-antigens, put back in mesenchymal stem cells and other cell types that can regulate, control, or shift the balance. So I see the future being doing clinical trials as a scientific discovery effort as well. And then finally, I think we need to continue to go back inside the cell, back to the transcriptome, and truly, truly understand the plasticity of the immune system. Because the other thing we've learned in the last few years is that the, the, the cells of the immune system are not dogmatic. They're not set in stone for the life of the cell. Regulatory cells can lose some of their stability and turn into effector cells in certain inflammatory settings. Uh, Th17 cells can be derived from interferon gamma producing cells. We have potentially tolerogenic settings um, that exist but then get perturbed by uh, the, the plasticity of the environment that we live in. 
And so the interface of the environment and genetics and how it controls that plasticity is key. And I think the key to that is really looking inside the nucleus at the genes, how they're just transcribed, what controls the program basically of these different cell types. And I suspect that we're going to find that a lot of the um, plasticity, a lot of the, the instability of the immune system in a tolerance uh, way is going to be based on a program that's set up in the, in, in the genome um, based in part on the genetics but in part on the epigenetics. And the exciting thing is that it already is being applied. I mean, it's only a few years ago that CTLA-4IG was approved as a drug uh, and now being used in a number of different uh, autoimmune and now most recently in transplantation. And literally, uh, we're talking about 15 years or maybe 18 years since the time it was first shown that CTLA-4IG could induce tolerance, that it's now made it into the, into the clinic uh, and, and into, into therapies that are used every day. Anti-CTLA-4 for cancer therapy will happen soon. Anti-PD-1 is making great strides in, in cancer therapy. Um, but as I say, I think that it's going to continue to grow. I think the concept of cell therapy is going to really take a hold. Maria uh, Roncarolo uh, in, in her uh, chapter talks about the, the work that's being done in graft versus host disease and using uh, uh, regulatory cells as a way to control graft versus host disease while allowing graft versus leukemia responses to take place. So I think that there's going to be an enormous application of tolerance uh, to, the, to the clinic and uh, we're going to continue to learn the lessons from pregnancy, the lessons from immune privilege sites as we, as we drive that research. So I know um, one important facet of your career has been the establishment of the Immune Tolerance Network and you mentioned it briefly. Can you tell us a little bit more about the um, goals of that network? Yeah. Well, we just celebrated our 10th year, which is very exciting. Uh, I've stepped down as director now and Jerry Nepom directs it. Uh, so, so there's life after uh, the 10-year period. I, I think the Immune Tolerance Network serves a number of purposes uh, that are important. One is I think it, it has created a sense in the community that we're willing to test in patients, in people, uh, tolerogenic uh, therapies uh, in which drugs will actually be re removed and that we can attain a state of um, tolerance where your immune system is intact while you're not uh, still targeting the tissue that you didn't want to target. So I think it's had a fundamental um, effect on how the community views therapies going forward. Very specifically, I think it's, it's made some real contributions from early work by David Sachs and his colleagues uh, through an ITN-sponsored trial demonstrating that bone marrow, bone marrow chimerism can lead to long-term survival of kidney allografts without uh, immunosuppression to more recent work in vasculitis where showing that treatment with uh, an anti-B cell antibody, anti-CD20, can have a long-term effect on, on Wegener's disease and others in keeping that in check. Uh, in the allergy and asthma area, there have also been some great uh, advances and some exciting trials going on looking at, for instance, uh, getting back to the early metawar work. If we introduce peanut uh, antigens early on in, in a baby within six months of age, can we induce a state of tolerance to peanut instead of the activation and allergies we see later on? So I think we've been able to, through the ITN, challenge some basic concepts to employ some of the things I talked about in terms of new science, but most importantly to get people to talk to each other, to have the allergists talking to the transplant surgeons, to have the rheumatologists talking to the, 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 the organ uh, specific uh, transplanters and really get some real sense of the community and what we're trying, trying to do. And couple all of that with a focus on mechanism. Because at the end of the day, it's not just putting a drug into a, into a patient that's really going to help us come to the solutions. It's going to be studying those patients, understanding what has happened to that immune system when we perturbed it with a given drug, following uh, the natural history of a 
of a patient who's prone to type 1 diabetes or prone to allergy to try to figure out what it is about their immune system which is different. And I think when we start to put together those mechanistic studies with the clinical outcomes that happen, that that's where we're going to really learn a lot about what's going to work and, and what's not going to work. And I think the ITN provides a, um, a scaffold for being those that the world and anyone in the world can apply and try to get resources to look at. Dr. Bluestone, thank you very much. It's truly been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you.